Setting up a web server can be daunting, but a clear guide makes all the difference. Today, I'm showing my step-by-step -step process, just like the one I use at work, to get you up and running securely. First things first, let's make sure the Raspberry Pi is up to date. This command does two things, sudo app update. This updates the list of available packages so your system knows what new versions are out there. And sudo app upgrade, this installs those updated packages, keeping everything current and secure. By running these commands, you're making sure that you're not using outdated or potentially vulnerable software. Now that your Raspberry Pi is up to date, let's get secure access set up by creating SSH keys. Open PuttyGen on your computer, click Generate. The randomness of your mouse movement helps create a unique and secure SSH key. Once the key is generated, save it somewhere safe. I'm just putting it on the desktop just for demonstration purposes. You'll also want to save your public key, as we'll need that for the Raspberry Pi in a second. Now we have the public key, it's time to put it on the server. First we're going to log into the Raspberry Pi using the password, just for now. Once logged in, run the following commands to create the necessary directory and set proper permissions. This creates the SSH folder where you'll store your public key. It's a hidden folder and these permissions make sure only you can access it. Now we'll paste the public key into this file, making sure that it's all on one line. And don't forget to prefix it with the SSH-RSA so it knows that it's the right format. Control and X to exit out of that file. Now we have access that's both secure and straightforward. OK, with that done, open PuTTY, load your previous web server connection, navigate to connection, SSH, auth and credentials, then select your private key. Once selected, go back to your session and prefix your IP address with your username, save and then click open. You should now be logged in without needing a password. For our next step, we're going to change the default port from 22. This will help reduce automated attacks as most bots specifically target that. To do that, we need to open the sshd config file. Once in, we simply change the port number and whilst we're here, we can disable password authentication so that the only way in is via our secure key and disable root logins as an additional precautionary step. Save the file and then restart the SSH service. Now, when we try connecting again, we'll get a connection refused. So let's change the port in our putty session and save it. And now we're back in. Our next step is to install a firewall. We'll be using UFW, which stands for Uncomplicated Firewall. To check if you have UFW installed, you can use the status command. And if not installed, we can run the sudo app install UFW command. Purpose of the firewall is to only allow access to the network port you want opening. To set up the firewall, we're going to create some rules. The first allowing us access to our SSH port and the second to our secure 443 port. I'm also going to allow temporary access to port 80 for testing purposes. With the rules set up, let's enable UFW. We can also check what rules are set by using the UFW status command. And that's our firewall done. Another important security application we're going to install is fail to ban. As usual, you can install it using the sudo app install command. This handy tool prevents brute force attacks by banning IP addresses after too many failed attempts to access the service. Once installed, we can run the systemctl start command, followed by the systemctl enable command. As we've changed our SSH port, we need to amend the config file to reflect this. To change the config, we open the jail.local file, found in the etc fail to ban directory. In the file, we're enabling the service to protect SSH on port 10022 with the logs going to our auth log file. The backend parameter refers to how our system logs file. For most Debian operating systems, we use systemd. And finally, we're allowing a maximum password retry of five. After a restart, we can check fail to ban is running using the systemctl status command. If you're having any difficulties, the fail to ban log file is a good place to start. The next step before installing Apache is setting up automatic updates. This is done by using the sudo app install unattended upgrades command. It's essential on any server, but especially important when facing the internet that applications are patched and have the latest security updates. However, I've experienced myself, major updates can break applications, so we're going to configure unattended updates to only allow security patches. It's important to review your versions and upgrade if you can. In the first configuration file, we need to focus on the security distributions. We simply comment out everything except for the security updates. After making these changes, remember to save the file to make the changes take effect. Next, we'll look at the auto upgrades configuration. Here, we're looking for confirmation that both updates and upgrades are set to occur daily. This is indicated by the number one on each relevant line. Finally, we can verify our unattended upgrade service is actually running, and we can do this with the systemctl status unattended upgrades command. 
With our base server ready, let's focus on the web server element. We only need to type in the sudo app install apache2 command to install apache. Once it's installed, we need to start the service with the systemctl start apache2 command and enable the service with the systemctl enable apache2 command. I'm also going to run the hostname minus i command to remind ourselves of our local IP address. With that, we should be able to type it in our browser and access the default Apache landing page. Out of the box, Apache serves insecure web pages via port 80. So let's have a look at securing this. Before we do anything, we need to enable the SSL and rewrite modules, followed by a restart. This is our first step to allow in secure connections. Our next step is to create a self-signed certificate. Self-signed certificates are quick to create and useful for providing encryption for internal and testing purposes. The OpenSSL command is essentially requesting a certificate valid for 365 days using the RSA 2048 format and stating where to store the certificates. Make a note of the paths as we'll need those in the next step. You'll be prompted for a couple of things, most of which are optional. The important ones are the country code and common name. Once we have a certificate, we need to create a virtual host to accept connections and point to those certificates. On the first line, virtual host signifies that we accept all connections on port 443. The second line is the server name. For testing, we're using the IP address. The third line is pointing to where we're storing our web files. The next line, we're turning on the secure sockets layer engine. Then we have the self-signed certificate and key paths we noted in the previous step. After saving the file, we need to enable the virtual host by using the Apache 2 enable site command followed by our config file name. If you haven't already, enable the Apache SSL module and restart Apache. Now, if we browse to our server using HTTPS, we'll get a secure connection. This is a self-signed certificate. The browser has no way of validating it, therefore we'll give a warning. As this is our own server, we can trust the connection. If you click the certificate, we can confirm the common name and organization. The next step is where we open the floodgates and allow internet access to our web server. If you want, you can save this step till later, after we've created a proper certificate in the next chapter. As I'm configuring this device at home, I'll connect to my local gateway, which is usually your IP address, with the last outlet as a 1. An easy way to find your router will be to open a terminal and either type in ipconfig on a Windows machine, or ifconfig on a Mac or Linux machine, and find the IP address next to gateway. From here, the instructions may vary depending on your provider, but you're looking for port forwarding, in my case, it's under the security section. Here, we put in the IP address of our web server and the port we want to use to accept web traffic. In my case, I'm opening it for port 80 for testing and port 443 for HTTPS. If you haven't yet set up a DNS name, you can type what is my IP in Google search and scroll down and find your public IP address. Copy this address and paste it into your web browser and you should be able to access your website from anywhere in the world via either HTTP or HTTPS. We don't really want to leave it like this for very long, so let's move quickly on to the next chapter using a proper certificate and HTTPS only. Before we install a certificate, unless you have one, we need a DNS name which keeps track of your IP address in case it changes. DuckDNS is a free service I've been using for years. Once signed in, type in a unique name in the field and click Add Domain. We'll need to take a note of the token ID and the domain name we've just created as we will need this in the next step. To ensure that the domain name is kept up to date, we edit the cron service. Cron is essentially a scheduler. In here, we can enter commands we want to run at a specific interval. We'll use the curl command, which is basically a way to interact with websites via a command line. I find it's helpful to construct the command and paste it into cron unless you're handy with a command line editor. Here, we're sending a message to DuckDNS every five minutes, sending our domain name and token ID. We've left the IP field blank as it will log our source IP when we run the command. After saving the file, our DNS name will now be dynamically updated with our IP address, and we can move on to installing a certificate. First of all, we'll install CertBot. This is an open source tool that obtains an SSL certificate from Let's Encrypt, automatically configures our HTTPS connections, and manages our certificate renewal. The command for installing a certificate is sudo certbot apache minus d and your domain name. Before installing, let me just show you a couple of errors you may come across. Initially, setup will ask you for your email address, agree to their terms and conditions and whether or not you'd like to sign up for the mailing list. There are a couple of reasons why the command may fail. The first is if you haven't got connectivity to your web server, so check that your firewall is open as per the previous step. The second, if when deploying you can't find your domain name listed, means that you haven't set up your virtual host. We do this by creating a new file in your site's available directory, 
with the name of your domain followed by .conf to make it easily identifiable. In here, we're only going to create the port 80 reference. A cert bot will create our SSL configuration for us. I'm only putting in two lines, a server name, which is our full domain name, and an alias for our local IP address. With the configuration file in place, we need to enable the site by using the Apache 2 enable site command, followed by our new config file. Finally, we restart Apache. Now, when we run the command again, if you follow the correct steps, you'll be prompted to agree to the terms and conditions and your certificate and config will be created. Or in my case, I will opt to reinstall this certificate to complete the installation. With that done, we can have a quick look at the config files that CertBot edited and created for us. Our locally signed certificate config remains the same. Our config for port 80 has been modified and will now redirect all insecure requests to our secure connection via our HTTPS address. In the final file, Let's Encrypt has created the full SSL config, including our server name, alias, and path to our certificate and key. With that done, we can now try connecting to our web server by a fully qualified domain name. And as we can see, there's no warning and the certificate is valid. OK, let's do a bit of housekeeping. The first thing I'm going to do is close port 80 on my firewall, as this is no longer required. And the second thing is to disable any unused site configs, and then give Apache a restart. The next step is to look at headers. I'm going to use securityheaders.com, which is a free tool which will analyse the security of your website's HTTP headers. It grades the site from A to F, helping us identify missing or misconfigured security headers. After submitting our domain name for a scan, it immediately comes back with an F, so let's start by focusing on four of the headers. We do this by editing our SSL config that CertBot created earlier. Here's a brief explanation of what I've added. Xframe options deny prevents your site from being displayed in frames or iframes, protecting it against clickjacking attacks. X content type options no sniff stops browsers from guessing content types, ensuring that they strictly adhere to the specified MIME type. XSS protection activates the browser's XSS filter to block pages when an attack is detected. However, modern security practice recommend in using the content security policy instead of this, which we'll cover later. Strict transport security forces browsers to use HTTPS for one year, enhancing secure connections to your site. After adding these, let's restart Apache and see what happens. If you get this error, it might be because you haven't enabled the headers module. This is a quick fix by using the Apache's enable headers module command. Once we've done that, we restart Apache again and refresh our security headers report. This is good, but there's still three headers we can improve on. Let's reopen our SSL file and add the following. The referrer policy is what controls what is sent to other websites when a link is clicked. The permissions policy controls access to features like geolocation, microphone, camera and full screen, and only allowing them for your site. Because I'm doing a lot of development on this server and it's not production, I'm not going to add the content security policy, although I'd strongly advise it. A content security policy header, or CSP, helps protect websites from various attacks, particularly cross-site scripting, XSS, and data injection attacks. When a CSP is added, the browser checks each resource, scripts, style sheets, images, and etc. against the policy before loading it. If a resource violates the policy, it's blocked from loading, therefore preventing potential malicious content from executing. Here is an example of how you might configure your own content policy. The structure after the colon consists of each parameter followed by a space and then the source that's allowed. With the exception of the object source, self is usually present as you will always want to accept resources from your own server and then you will want to list the other sources that you want to use in your projects, terminating the line with a semicolon. Now let's save our file, restart Apache and return to securityheaders.com. This time, with the exception of our content security policy, things are looking a lot better. One thing we don't want is our directory listings exposed to the internet as we don't want our structure or potentially sensitive files viewed by the public. To demonstrate, I'm going to create a test directory and file in our web directory. Sure enough, when we enter that directory in a browser, the contents are shown. To fix this, we're going to open up our SSL config and add the following lines. Minus indexes is the key point here. This disables the directory listing. The plus follow sim links allow symbolic links, which is generally fine unless you're dealing with a more restrictive security environment. Allow override none, this disables the HD access files from overriding your configuration, which is good for security if you don't need per directory overrides. However, if you do need to use the HD access files, you can change this to allow override all. Require all granted, this grants access to all users, which is typically required for public websites. 
Now we can save the file, reload Apache, and when we revisit the page, we are presented with a forbidden error, denying access to the directory. Here we can see our Apache version. Hiding this information reduces the attack surface by making it harder for potential attackers to identify and exploit version-specific vulnerabilities. To do this, we edit the security config found in the Apache 2 config available directory. Here, we set the server tokens to production, shortened to prod, and we turn the server signature off. We also add the header always unset X powered by. Combining all three reduces the visibility of our server when responding to HTTP requests. If you missed the step earlier, you can enable the headers module with the Apache 2 module headers command. Once we've done all that, the version number is no longer shown. With that, we've got a pretty secure web server that I wouldn't have any problem putting on the internet. If you're interested in configuring a web application firewall or further securing your web server, drop me a message in the comments and you never know, by the time the next person views this tutorial, it might already be there to help them. As always, thanks for watching and if you get a chance to like or subscribe, I'd really appreciate it. Thanks all.